Um, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we are going to get started with our conversation with Dr. Kel Kelly Morgan, and uh, we are going to talk about the uh, various exhibitions that, uh, and various posts, I should say, as well as the online exhibition that Dr. Morgan uh, prepared for all of us to discuss. So I just want to start by welcoming everyone. My name is Hrag Bartanyan. I'm the editor-in-chief and co-founder of Hyperallergic. Um, and Hyperallergic is located here in Brooklyn, which is historically the land of the Lenape, the Shinnecock, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, I just want to welcome Dr. Uh, Kelly Morgan. Uh, some of you, uh, I don't think a lot of you are going to need a lot of introduction, but I just want to point out that Dr. Morgan is a professor of the practice um, and the inaugural director of curatorial studies uh, at Tufts University. Um, she's a curator, an educator, a social justice activist who specializes in American art and visual culture. Her scholarly commitment to the investigation of anti-Blackness within those fields has demonstrated how traditional art history and museum practice work specifically is used to uphold white supremacy. So, Dr. Morgan, welcome. Hi, Harag. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So, um, I wanted to, I, I, you know, I, the question I've been dying to ask you uh, uh -huh. just to kind of get things started is how uh, the experience of doing an online exhibition may have been different for you or how it, how you found the experience in general. I've done this before. So I've done it. I did a digital exhibition or virtual, virtual <laughs> exhibition for the National Academy of Design in, I think that was the fall of 2020. But I did not get a chance to, in that show, because it was contemporary artists. So I always try to be mindful about my all of my curatorial stuff, right? <laughs> so I didn't get a chance to like explain as much. So I think in this regard, it was really wonderful because I was able to like put my scholar hat on, you know, um, along with the curatorial hat and write it almost like a short essay. You know, and the and I think a lot of times we get frustrated about that, at least us, you know, historical curators, because you can't put it all on a label, right? <laughs> right. right. We try to like make the connections. Um, and sometimes, like particularly with this project, I'm not always able to or haven't been, right, always able to convince institutions to borrow the material culture. Right. That actually fill in the gaps. So it was really nice to be able to just have that there through the images. Right. So let's get started with the first piece so we can sort of talk about um, what it is you sort of did here. And if people have questions, I just want to say if anyone has questions, feel free to add them to the Q&A. Um, and we'll be happy to answer them as we go along. Um, and just feel free. And we're just going to try to integrate them as much as possible. So let's just get started. OK, here we are. So the first project we're looking at here is how can museums truly shake off their colonial legacy? So now, I mean, this is a huge question, of course. Yeah. Um, you're well, as you're well aware, but what do you think that most people misunderstand about this topic? And why did you think it was important to sort of focus on this aspect? Because they can't, right? <laughs> right? right. They, can't, they can't shake off their colonial legacy. Um, it's baked into the DNA. And for us to have any kind of significant conversation about it, as a field, we have to actually start being honest about that. You know, so much of what brought me to, or no, I shouldn't say what brought me to the work, because I've been trying to do, well, you know, right, right? Like I've been trying to do the work to no avail my entire career. Um, but one thing that I was so ecstatic, you know, about this opportunity with you all in the, in the Tremaine Foundation was I was like, finally, right? <laughs> Like here's a here's a place where I can get it out in, in in just some kind of succinct manner, you know, to say, like we have been talking about, I call it exotic chicken syndrome, right? <laughs> where there are those of us in the field who are like, it is clearly a duck. Not only is it a duck, it's a mallard duck, right? <laughs> you know? And you have leadership in the field that are like, no. It's just this really new genetically modified exotic chicken, right? And I'm just like, I, I'd like hit a wall, you know, in the fall where I was like, I am so sick of this, I could scream. You know? 
So I was like, all right, now that I got this opportunity, I said, I'm gonna lay it out in just one, you know, just, you know, one or two sort of points of what the issue actually is. Um, and one of those major issues is the fact, one, that we don't admit it, right, that the colonial legacy is baked in, and two, that the vast majority of museum professionals, directors, trustees have no idea how to recognize it. Um, and even when they do, they don't know how to address it. Right. And how much of that do you think is, is partly because the United States hates to think of itself? Like, they, I think Americans like to think of this, they sort of rejected you know, this British, bid bad British, but there, is it this just sort of strange identity complex? I mean, what is it that you think is part of the issue in the United States? Because, you know, you go to Europe, it's pretty clear there's a colonial legacy. I think here people have a, I don't know, they have a, a strange relationship to it. How would you describe it? I think because slavery happened on the continent, mm -hmm. um, I think because culture, like we know indigenous and Native Americans were not literally erased, right? But I think culture in American society is set up in a way, right, where we think Native peoples just don't exist because we don't see them at Target, right? Or we don't see them at the Starbucks every day. Um, and so it was this idea, or really truly this fantasy, right? This fantasy, fantasy, this mythology of like freedom and democracy <laughs> and liberty without any kind of real discussion, nuanced understanding, right, of the colonial practices that allow, right, for that mythology um, to exist. Right. You know? Right. And, and continue. I mean, one of the things yeah. in one of the pieces that I love that you wrote was just the fact that as much as these structures exist, every day we're making decisions to propagate it. Yes. And that's the part that I think is, is, is hard for people to understand because sometimes, you know, you want to do what sort of quote unquote works in their mind, right? You know, and it's sort of, it has a different connotation. So now with this article, what do you think, um, how would you characterize the way you sort of started um, in so, terms of this three piece, this three piece um, thing you've done for the, for the project? So I started out, I was like, let me name one of the one of the issues. Um, I chose representation very purposefully um, because it's always touted or is continuously touted, frequently touted as the solution. Um, it is not. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, so I wanted to start there with like the thing that everybody would know. Um, and then the second article kind of gives like a how to, right? So like the, here's how we can push representation to do a little bit more. Um, and then the uh, the exhibition, which is more so like here are more examples, right, of other ways of ways to do this. Um, but I wanted to give people, I wanted to go back to you know the Wondercomer, you know, and art like not just art museum history, but like the history of what I like to call the museum complex. So how collecting in and of itself when we talk about global collections, literally began as a practice of theft. Right. Like literally, right? <laughs> right. I just got contacted um, by the producers of History's Mysteries. They're doing this, this uh, episode on the Isabella uh, Stewart Gardner Museum. Right. Um, and they're going to interview me for it. And it was so funny because the producer was like, well, what do you think? And I was like, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, what do you mean? And I was just like, Collecting in and of itself started off as theft. So when I teach this heist, right, I said I teach it to get people to really think about what theft really means and like what's valued, what's not valued. Like how are we having a whole like cable television show about these 13 works stolen from this woman's institution and you have the nation of Nigeria that has been asking for their cultural patrimony back for the last 75, 80 years, right? <laughs> and there's like nothing, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, and you can say that about, you know, so many different um, nations, you know, it, just right here on, on, you know, in the United States. So she was like, that was like, nobody's ever said it like that before. And I'm like, I'm sure, right? <laughs> So she's like, would you do the interview? I was like, I would love to do the interview because yeah, because everybody needs to like 
think, you know, need to rethink, you know, how, how we're thinking about the whole idea of theft. So I wanted to really come um, to really start, you know, this project off with that idea, right? right. Like how we all got here, you know, right. with this, this wealth um, that grew, you know, from colonial activity. Yeah. You know, the, the part of this that I think is, uh, and I, I love your thoughts on this, because I think whenever we talk about museums, the one part that I often have people telling me is like, you know, I just want to feel good about going to a museum. And there are people like have this kind of sense that some of us who are trying to raise these issues are somehow trying to deter that experience. Now, how would you respond to that? Because, you know, it's like, at that point, you, you know, you feel like, okay, well, I don't, Think that's what I'm doing but <laughs> you know I always said that that's a privileged rock right like you know um that stood out to me so viscerally you know during my time at PAFA as well as when I was at IMA um when I would walk through with BIPOC or like underrepresented groups and you could just see the shrinking you know, or like the way that like um, students would kind of like hold themselves, right, <laughs> in the space. And I'm like, that whole feeling good thing depends on who you are, depends on what you look like, right? <laughs> it depends on what, what your class status is, because that idea um, of, or like that feeling, like that experience of feeling good going into a space, um, does not translate for all of us right you know I remember when a long time ago you know people would ask me um you know what's like the scariest thing you know or what's like you know your most your most fearful thing and I would be and I would always say you know to be the only black woman in a room full of white men hmm. and it was always like you know like the pause right <laughs> where people were just like Oh, I didn't think about that or like oh my gosh and I'm like yeah you know that's like the the like I have turned I have walked in rooms and turned right around and walked out you know and I was like so when you go into a space you know start where you know whiteness white supremacy um discrimination is literally in the design it's in the architecture it's in the work on the walls no I'm not gonna feel good right <laughs> in that space at all. Right. But um, OK, so, so now we're looking at the second post mm -hmm. where you where you really sort of focus in on portraiture, because I think this is I mean, what I liked about this was I think every museum has some collection of portraiture at some point. Right. Mm -hmm. whether, it's, whether they're photographs or paintings or sculptures or I don't know anything, frankly. So now why do you think that um, I mean, because a lot of the stuff what you're saying seems very obvious in many ways, mm -hmm. but. But a lot of institutions are stuck here. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. You know, because I'm an Americanist, right? Portraiture was like my go-to piece, my go-to piece. Because I think portraiture is like one of the most obvious ways, um, or I would say obvious sort of bodies of work, you know, to, to demonstrate this stuff. Primarily because, um, like you said, all institutions, like have hordes of portraits, portraits of people who don't even matter that are just sitting in storage, right? <laughs> right. Or like here's uh, portraits in books or something like that, right? Yes, you know, so it's like, so this whole idea of representation, right? Is where it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we have to like buy all the black and brown artists and we have to buy all the women artists. It's this idea that white folks ain't been representing themselves to the hill right? <laughs> since the dawn of time, right? So it's like, it's not just BIPOC people who enjoy seeing themselves, right? Like human beings enjoy seeing themselves. So that was one thing. The second thing was, again, as an Americanist, I got so tired of fielding conversations, facilitating conversations, be it private or public, with Americanists across the country who were just like, well, we don't know. Well, we don't know what to do. Well, we don't know. <laughs> you know and I was like at this point you don't know because you don't you don't actually want to know right? right um so I I got fed up with that and so I was like okay well let me actually like publish something to say here is how right the role like Portia Moore always says like the roadmaps are there have been there since good grief at least the 70s 
Um, and at some point we have to just admit that as an American, as American art as a field, right? Just does not want to actually do that work. You know, right. but as somebody like myself, somebody like Horace Ballard, right? Somebody like Layla Bermeo, somebody like Stephanie Sparlin Williams, who are like younger sort of, I hate to call us emergent at this point, but anyway, like <laughs> like mid-career Americanists um, who approach the field in a very different way. It's super frustrating, you know, to just constantly have these conversations. Um, and so I really wanted to lay out, like if you just look at portraiture, you can tap into so many different um issues power right, right shared traditions um you know contemporary manifestations it's all of these things that come out through the work right that come out through the work themselves but if you really engage the works in conversation with each other you can actually take those themes and apply them to institutional culture <laughs> right. you know so that was another reason um, why I wrote this piece in that way, right? Because I wanted people to have a roadmap um, to, you know, where, and I'm also, it was also kind of an experiment to Harag, where I was like, now I want to see what the, what excuses are going to be manufactured, like after this catches on, right? <laughs> no, it makes sense. It makes sense. I, so what do you think some of the challenges are? Because you've worked at institutions. When you have that, say, a concept of the show, where mm. are the stumbling blocks? Where are the places that you've seen? Is it because people don't want to veer from what they already know? I mean, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about in museums is how so much knowledge is so specific and it's everything is so siloed. Is it, yeah. is it the fear of going beyond your silo? I mean, what are some of the anxieties you've seen? Oh God, yeah, some of it is just flat out laziness, mm. right? We've done it this way for so long. I'm comfortable, right? I'm 25, 30 years into my career, right? This was how I was trained to be a curator, right? <laughs> or this is how I was trained to be an art historian. This is the trajectory to become a director. Um, and so, and it worked, you know, for a lot of people. Um, so to come in and say, yeah, nah, this ain't really working, <laughs> you know, for the vast majority of people. Um, yeah, a lot of it is. A lot of it is just flat out, just like people who just don't want to do the work. Um, I think to some degree, it is also like a classism and a, and, and, a, and, and, and elitism, you know, mm -hmm. um, I try not to harp on the new field situation, but that like that job description was written the way that it was because not just this project, but some of my other projects and a few of my um, colleagues in interpretation, um, three of my other you know curatorial colleagues, we were doing projects that very deliberately shifted, right? The visitor demographic you know, in the member demographic. So in like a year and a half, you know, our audience had become way browner, <laughs> right? Than Newfield's audiences had ever been. Um, and so the whole idea of like, you know, maintaining this traditional white audience was very purposeful on their part because they were like, wait a minute, you know, all like here come all the brown people, but we're losing white people. Um, and they actually weren't losing white folks. They were losing, a, they were, scared right that they were going to ostracize a particular demographic right of white donors and patrons whatever um <clears throat> but the fascinating thing harag is that audiences are hungry for this work right. you know they want to have these conversations so that was another fascinating you know a uh, discovery for me in that moment because i was like oh leadership here at new fields isn't pissed off <laughs> Oh, so right. much the work is like controversial. They're pissed off at the fact that it's actually working. So I was <laughs> like, there's a status quo, right? That's like tr that certain institutions would like to maintain. Um, and as I, you know, did reconnaissance work across the field, you know, <laughs> the years after my resignation, um, there were so many other people, you know, curators, interpreters, educators alike, you know, who had been experiencing similar things right right so you know so it's like a so I could hear you know just in 
kind of projecting right now. You know, I could hear my senior leadership at New Fields and even maybe my senior leadership at Pava too would say, well, yeah, hyper allergic is where something like this belongs. Right. Right. <laughs> like at, during those times, they wouldn't say that shit now that they've like reinvented themselves. Right. Yeah. You know, but um, but it's like, oh yeah, like that's that's an essay, you know, right. that doesn't belong in the gallery. Um, but I yeah, see. that that's my long-winded right, right. <laughs> answer, like where that is, yeah, where those hangups are. So okay, so now let's look at the exhibition. But before we look at the exhibition, I want to ask about because you know, obviously, this is a topic I think about quite a bit because we're mm-hmm. doing a lot of coverage um in different ways. Um, But one of the issues that I'm finding with this is how do you think people, like part of the issue I'm seeing with that, particularly with institution is these kinds of challenges to sort of the status quo often bring perhaps feedback from the audience or what somebody might think of as conflict or just emotional responses or any kind of thing. But there's an aversion towards institutions against any kind of those types of interactions. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we resolve those two things? Because, you know, one can't happen without the other. Right. And because of the word count, (laughs) I had to cut that part out, right? Right. (laughs) Of of the second article. So I do have, and I can tell you, um, you know, just really quickly, I've worked with the Clay Studio in Philadelphia on that part. So part of, one way to reconcile that is to bring the community fully into the institution. Um, so in, in the Clay Studio example, I hate to say it was easier, but for lack of a better way, a better word, a way of describing it, it was easier for Clay Studio because they were building a new building, you know, and they were going into a new um, a new neighborhood. And Jennifer's Willie, their, you know, um, curator of artistic programs, you know, came to me and was like, we want to do this right. <laughs> you know, we do not want to go in, you know, contributing to gentrification. And I said, okay, you know, well, you got to go in and listen, you know, number one. Um, And then, you know, went down a list of other things, you know, you have to care about what the community cares about, you know, see what what the community is already doing. How can you provide resources? Do they even want your resources, right? Do they even want you there? Um, And surprisingly, um, they actually did it, right? (laughs) Because a lot of people ask me for my advice and it never actually like do the work. Right. Um, and they right. did the, and so two years, you know, I would say two to three years of just relationship building, mm-hmm. you know, before, before they even got to the, you know, the institution itself. Um, and then, so from that came asking the community, like what they wanted the most, you know, in terms of what the galleries look like you know, what the building looked like. So accessibility was a thing. So where we were kind of as curators, because I was the like external evaluator. So we were really concerned about, okay, the objects and, you know, labels and, and they like totally didn't care. Right? It was like benches. It ain't nowhere to sit, right? <laughs> 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 they didn't get, they were just like, y'all know what y'all doing with the <laughs> objects. We need somewhere to sit, right? <laughs> so it was so cool. And I was like, man, you know, we, cause like, I think as curators, we do, we get so caught up on like, oh, are we interpreting the object correctly? And it's not that the Kensington community didn't like care about the objects in the galleries, but they cared more about being comfortable in the gallery. So Clay Studio, you know, um, built a partnership with Tiny, P- Tiny PA um, and the community got together. And this was people throughout, throughout the community. Um, and they built the gallery furniture, like down to like the foam on the cushions, right? <laughs> right. The height from, in, so that kind of thing. So opening day, you know, community comes in and they're like, that's my bench, you know, or like, that's my, so it's, it is the way that you, there's so many ways, you know, that you can allow um, community members to lend their own expertise Um we also pay community members like for their time too, over the two and a half, three years, um, because everybody's not necessarily going to want to be involved with the curatorial process. Right. Um, and we did do that. Like I facilitated a whole like gallery didactic, you know, label writing exercise that came directly from, um, you know, the, the community's interest, right, for 
like for objects in the gallery and that kind of thing so they can hear their voices too um but it's just bringing them into the entire process Right. You know, and then they can pick and choose whether they want to be a part of the exhibition process, whether they want to be a part of the, you know, right. seating design, right? <laughs> but Kelly, what I've seen is education departments are more than happy to do this and do that work. Curatorial departments aren't always so happy doing that. Mm -hmm. And there's a conflict right there in yes. an institution around a show. I mean, okay. I'm not gonna, you obviously don't have to solve this, but I just, I just want to sort of say that's what I've tended to see. No, I'm always like curators need to get over themselves. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm one of those, I am a curator that's very much so about decentering myself, right? right? In, in the process, I always have been. Um, not everybody is though, you know, that's right. not. and, and that silo, you know, like you said, that barrier is, is very real, um, where curators just, assume right or expect you know educators or public programmers you know right. to do that work it's like here is here is my beautiful exhibition now make it work for the for the minions right, right. right. Exactly. you know it's like I can't stand um you know that type of attitude and it's a lot of folks you know who who feel absolutely like absolutely so let's go to some of the questions before we go to the exhibition um okay. Lana Herzog just sort of mentioned I guess she's asking about defining representation here. And I think um, if I can just sort of help you here, just you, you meant in terms of seeing yourself in the museum and sort of representing communities you might belong to, correct? Yes, you know, and cause you know, and I can't, I didn't open the Q and A, but I'll say like as a black woman, um, conversations in like the sort of broader black art community is all about representation, right? Like, how are we being represented? Where are we being represented? How many Black artists are you collecting? Um, um, it's it's almost trite for me, right, at this point. Um, and so, because I can think back, you know, as a historian, so I'm just like, okay, so Benny Andrews, you know, was working on this, <laughs> you know, with Norman Lewis and a whole bunch of other people. You know, in 1968, Dana Chandler, right, was challenging the MFA Boston about this in the 70s. You know, Faith Ringo literally was outside MoMA in the Whitney for a good amount of time, right? Um, and it wasn't just, neither of those artists, right, neither of those um, movements were was just about representation. Even Fred Wilson's Mind in the Museum was not just about representation. Um, you know, it was about autonomy, you know, and actually like activating the work like through Black epistemologies and through Black ways of knowing. So now, what are we, 40 years later, I'm at a point where like, I don't want to hear shit else about representation. <laughs> like not that representation isn't important, but now we need to do more than that. Like we need to this do more than just- Representation hey, is this part of the conversation and there's yes. this. And it's this, yes. It's yes. like- I like, I'm so glad you bought, you y'all acquired the Titus Kafar and the Micheline Thomas and the Simone. Like, I am so happy. <laughs> but it's like, what are you doing with it? Right? <laughs> right, exactly. What's next? Okay, What's so next? now let's see. Maggie Shaheen, I'm a museum studies undergrad student and the notion of discomfort is something I've been getting used to and discussing a lot as I'm learning more in my, in my studies. What kind of interventions can we make maybe visually or with text juxtaposed to art architecture at museums to prompt people to think more critically about how others may feel uncomfortable. Do you have any times where you've seen the light bulb go off with someone in a museum where they emphasize with that or empathize, I'm guessing, with that discomfort that they've never felt before? Yeah, one thing that I did, Maggie, at Newfields is, and it wasn't, it was super subtle, right? So I didn't actually change the design of the gallery itself. I did change some of the works. Um, Cause Newfields had this weird thing where like the labels had to match the paint on the color on the wall, right? <laughs> right. So I wrote a much more critical um, interpretive script though. So when people came to the label expecting to kind of read the typical thing that you would read about a William McGregor Paxson, right, nude or a Tiffany window, and it was talking about lynching, right, and how, you know, white femininity was this mythology, da-da-da-da-da, people were like, oh my God, mm -hmm. <laughs> 
you know, so I wanted to kind of trick the eye in that way, you know, where it was like so unassuming, like, oh, you know, okay, the gallery hasn't really changed, even though it changed like the title. But when you actually engage the labels, the labels say it's something totally beyond, right, what anybody would expect. Um, and shaking, because that it was a really white space, you know, that was one of the reasons why I actually reinterpreted that gallery through the lens of lynching. Um, cause it was a space that was so centered in white, <laughs> in whiteness, all white artists, right. Whiteness at the turn of the century, which is like the worst, you know, one of, right. The worst times in the, in the States. Um, so that's something that I've done that, um, that isn't so obvious. Cause I feel like the contemporary intervention, right. So like you have the portrait gallery of John Singer Sargent's and we just put the Micheline Thomas in there. Right, like that's the thing, you know, that not that that's a bad, um, that that's a bad approach, but it's like, we have to actually start unpacking the historical works themselves. Right. You know, because Micheline Thomas didn't necessarily create the work that she created to speak against John Singer Sargent's, like, right. like, <laughs> like, come on, you know. Right. Um, and so I was, I'm, trying to challenge, you know, any, you know, curators that are on the call right now, you know, that are in the webinar right now, like stop putting contemporary art and artists and curators on corrective duty, like do the research, you know, and unpack the works that are in your collections. Good. Okay. Well, let's see. So let's see. Um, some of these other questions, there's, okay, let's start with, uh, Jamie Lee Hassan said, love your statement, curators need to get over themselves. Okay, I'm not surprised that was popular. Um, <laughs> okay, so now someone's asking, would love to hear any thoughts if you're willing to share about ways to think about how these issues are embedded in the physical architecture of museums as well. That's an interesting question. I guess some people are wondering how the physical architecture is manifesting this. I guess for me, the most obvious would be often there in sort of Greek or Roman sort right. of like styles, for mm -hmm. instance. But I know it's far, far more than that. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, they have this, this like Templar effect um, or look. Um, I think the, the kind of, you know, really hard granite marble floors. Right. Um, so also mausoleum. Yeah. So there are these, uh, mm, what's the word that I want to want to use? Like, pristine kind of honor like church, like catholic church right right um, like veneration right? right right and then when you think about neoclassical architecture where in the united states history do we see neoclassical architecture <laughs> right. mostly outside of state buildings right plantations that's right you know what I mean? And so that like, so there's this whole, and you can Google this, you know, as if after this, if you get a chance, but there's a whole, there's a whole field called plantation geography, right? <laughs> right. That talks about, you know, just even like the level of the land, right. Where how, again, the, the, the house, like the big house is structured in neoclassical architecture. Um, it sits high on this hill. Um, so go look at Mount Vernon, right. The next time you get a, you get a sense to like study George Washington, right. Or look at Monticello, um, you know, look at the Hermitage, right. So all of these places that were plantations, those are three, just three, right, right, that were also president homes. You see what I mean? And so the power dynamics, you know, are there. Um, and I think we actually do respond to them subconsciously, whether we know so, whether we know, know it or not. No, absolutely. I mean, I think a good example is like the Metropolitan Museum in New York. When you walk in, the staircase leads to the European galleries, yep. right? And then where do you find the African collections? Where do you find, you know, the other, exactly. It's like some, but it's not actually conceptually, it's not central to your experience of the architecture. And I think, I think that we can all agree that that sort of is very clear. Um, I mean, even the British Museum, I mean, where, the, where, where are the Benin bronzes? They're in the basement somewhere. Yes. Right? Yeah, and the you British know? Museum is like the worst. Right, exactly. So, so often, often the spatial geography of a museum can also sort of represent what you're saying. Absolutely. Right. 
Okay, so now let's see. Uh, another question. Thank you for taking your time, Kelly. Uh, I'm having a lot of the same questions you laid out for us while studying in museum studies. I've been recently been thinking about where museums might start with reconstruction and what models we might look at when beginning. Um, I guess the question is, has this entered your conversation uh, or research yet? Uh, everyone's looking for these sort of like, you know, things that they can sort of hold on to or look at or emulate. Um, you know, I know some of the, you've already cited a lot in the articles there, but is there anything for someone in museum studies that they may be interested in knowing about? Yeah, look at the empathetic museum. You know, um, I think we really want to move toward a more horizontal, you know, and circular, right, <laughs> structural instead of vertical higher, hierarchical. Um, I can't think of any institution that's actually functioning in that way currently. Uh, off the top of my mind. There are some um, smaller organizations who do, um, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head, you know, right now. Um, but yeah, in terms of that, like restructuring, it needs to be, in, beyond saying it needs to be more equitable. It's like, that's what it needs to look like, right? It needs to be more horizontal and, and, and cyclical, not cyclical, circular. <laughs> totally. By the way, have you, uh, I know this sounds like a random question, Kelly, but I'm going to ask, have you ever heard of a, mu of a curator perhaps being sort of like being held accountable when they repatriated an object or like somehow was seen as negative? Has that ever happened? Because I was Not trying to think of that the other day and I couldn't think of an instance where that happened. Mm -mm. I mean, I think they're, 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 ugh, there's been pushback you know, in that word, so you, so going back to the British Museum, right, where, like, they're the, they're the cheerleader in the flat out no, right, <laughs> like, no, I'm not doing this, um, and I think more so than it being criticism, Rag, it's more of, like, a pat on the back, because we gave one, right, so it's, like, look at us, we've done, let me, like, let me put the feather in my cap, because we gave the one Benin bronze out of the 5,000, right, <laughs> right, that are that are in various collections. Um, <laughs> it's more, it's a weird virtue signaling thing. You know, I think my friend like Kajet Solomon would have a different take on it because I know she's like actually been involved in Rizzy, you know, giving theirs back. Um, but like I think it's a it's an opposite thing, right? That occurs, you know, where it's not so much a a poo-poo, you know, it's almost like an over celebration. Um, because it's like Technically, you should give it all back. Technically. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, well, we're getting more and more questions, so I think I'm going to keep going. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, and then we'll get to the exhibition in a few minutes. So, okay. Um, let's see. We'll start here. Um, what do you think is going to move the needle more quickly and effectively? Marginalized, underrepresented artists showing at galleries and spaces dedicated to amplifying their voices or pushing harder for curatorial appointments and shifts in visitor demographics at the old guard museums where change comes more slowly? Ooh, okay, this is so specific. What yeah, do you think? we need both. You know, we need both. both. Yeah, we we'll need do both. Do one. Mm -hmm. Because it's yeah, like you can't do, it's like we have to do all of it. Like people ask me all the time, like, <laughs> Our, you know, museums redeemable. And I'm like, absolutely not. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm like, but they're not going anywhere anytime soon. You know, we still have a generation of students who are coming out of school, you know, coming out of grad school, needing to intern or needing to fellowship or needing jobs in these places. So as long as they exist, you know, somebody like me also has to exist. Um, I like to say sometimes I like dwell in like the underbelly, right, of the of the field. Um, to prep people, you know, because it's like we have to, we have to do both, like those safe spaces um, that definitely like celebrate, you know, um, artists, you know, from marginalized groups across the board, you know, are, are absolutely necessary because that's where you can go and get the solace, right? That's where you can go and get the hug, right? <laughs> that's where you can go and get respected. It gives you another option. You know, I've talked to several, you know, contemporary artists and, and curators recently who are just like, I'm done. You know, I'm done with traditional institutions. There are other ways. You know, I tell my my um, studio students all the time, like there, there are various art worlds, <laughs> you know, so figure right. out like, which one you want to be in. Um, no, we need, we need both options. We need yeah. both options. And I'm adamant about, you know, saying now that traditional institutions are not the end all be all. 
You know, they need us more than we need them wholeheartedly. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is, I feel like in the last few decades, I don't think institutions realize how how much less power they have in a way, where I feel like there's more diversity in terms of the options we have and that what we consider an institution and the types Mm -hmm. of... And, and I think that's like, they need this only to survive because the truth is things have changed incredibly. Incredibly, yes. You yes. know, like it's just, it's, 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 you know, like there's no institution that is the center of a con- the conversation anymore. It's just no. the reality. Yes. And I think that's one thing institutions don't want to hear and mm-hmm. aren't ready for the reality. Mm-hmm. So I think that's sort of, you know, I think it's really an interesting sort of uh, change. Okay, so now we have a question here, and I'm sure you receive a lot of questions like this, talking about saying they're the uh, the only Black docent at a major state museum, and daily they deal with many micro uh, assaults. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if it is worth the fight, fighting the fight, always educating. My lens, my language is so different. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we help people like this stay motivated, knowing that they are doing incredible work, um, but at the same time, I mean, none of us are martyrs. How no. do you keep them motivated? And I was like, and don't yeah, definitely don't be the martyr. No. Um, for that, I would always you know my response is know your why, right? Um, know why you're there. You know, um, my second answer to that is give yourself your full range of emotion pick your battles, you know, you don't always have to respond, Um, you know, if you need to respond, (laughs) you know, in a pretty confrontational, like, I'm a very confrontational person, (laughs) so I'm always like, if you need to respond in a very confrontational way, like, do so, Um, because I've come to understand in my experiences that a lot of times the racial microaggressions are purposeful, right, and so here's my historical reasoning for that. So a Malcolm X quote, right? Um, when he was given ballot, ballot of the bullet um, here in Detroit, you know, he said, anytime you're south of the Canadian border, you're south, right? And the inability, right, to speak back to white people in general was de facto legal, <laughs> like on the books, law, right, in the South, it was de jure segregation, right, or or de jure cultural practice, meaning like just social culture, um, social custom and accepted, right, throughout the rest of the country. So white Americans, right, whether they know it or not, whether they were, you know, staunch Southerners uh, or have a Southern background, have been socialized to, to expect a type of deference, right? Because they've been socialized into a place of privilege. So a lot of times the things are said to you um, in the ways in which they are um, because they know that we can't say anything back. Mm. Historically, right? We were never really allowed to say anything back because, you know, it could very much so get you killed. So that, when we talk about generational trauma, (laughs) <laughs> right is the general generational trauma that a lot of white americans carry right. how you combat that is speaking back to it right mm-hmm. <laughs> um and that was a lesson i learned you know in in my own i have a ted talk you know about this very thing you know where i started actually responding to it and then i would respond to it in different ways right and see what the different like what type of responses, right, I would get, um, depending on the age, right, of whoever the kind of white person was. Um, The other thing I started doing is I just started removing myself from the place, from the space, you know, like the white aggression comes, and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I'm not doing that, right, (laughs) and I just leave, you know, I leave the space, I leave the room, you know, I have no problem um, removing myself, because I think as Black people, we we tend to feel that way, like, we got to fight it, and it's like, no, you don't have to fight it all the time. Is this no. the one that feed at the table of systemic racism in art museums? Is that the talk? Yes, that's the talk. Okay, I'm going to share it here for people who may be interested in checking it out later. Okay, so someone's saying, I teach a multinational graduate program at the European Graduate School. Hope to share this with them. Will there be a way? Absolutely. We'll have it posted on uh, YouTube shortly. So uh, you'll af- absolutely have a way to share it with them. 
Okay, another question, question from Amy Lifford. Um, how might we alter higher ed to encourage new approaches to art history and curatorial practice to create critical intellectual projects? Grad schools can be so stifling. Yeah, I welcome to my current world, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh God. So Amy is like, I went from the frying pan into the fire. Uh, um, um, but you have to look outside, at least me. It's like, I look outside the discipline. Like this is one of the reasons I've had um, as many issues as I've had. Cause I was, I've been bringing black feminists, critical race, black studies, right? Decolonial queer studies, performance studies, theories and frameworks to art history, right? <laughs> and the study of visual culture. And that doesn't read right, or compute in traditional art history. Um, so I've had, I mean, even my, my colleagues at Tufts, it was, it was a really hostile response, you know, to, to my hire. I know and if, if it's people, you know, on here from Tufts, that like people hate when I say that, but, like, <laughs> but it really was. Um, right. Because as somebody who's, who is very staunchly, right, anti-white, anti-white, anti-whiteness, anti-white supremacy, anti-whiteness as a system, um traditional art history is like in my crosshairs all the time right like I don't even um I was talking about this to some uh, to some friends of mine at the Barnes Museum recently because they're working on a, a William Edmondson show right and so Edmondson and you know the whole story of modern art and I was like none of it applies right <laughs> and they were like what do you mean and I was like William Edmondson didn't give a shit about modern art you know like about the modern art narrative one that was not what he was creating for Two, the modern art narrative has always been problematic because it created itself or developed itself through its own racist imaginary of a so-called primitive African that doesn't fucking exist. Right? <laughs> so I was like, I can't. You know? right. Um, right. And so it's like that, those kinds of things, Amy, it's like coming at it from, um, and this is why I include Cesaire and Du Bois in the pieces, um, you know, even Toni Morrison in a way, Bell Hooks talks about this a lot in her work. You know, you have to go to other scholars, Franz Fanon, Paulo Freire, Eric Williams, Walter Rodney, you know, um, black and brown scholars, you know, who have been writing about these things. Um, more from a, a political right standpoint or historical, like political history or historical standpoint, but you can figure out how to apply right to art history um, or to particular um, eras or aspects of visual culture. So, okay, we're going to jump right to the exhibit, but just one quick question from someone I think is just kind of it's poetic. And I think mm -hmm. that it's, it could be really interesting. Um, obviously, this is resonating with this person and they ask, how do you, how do I know when to fight and when not to fight? Depends on how you feel like, if how you feel. You know, if like I tell my students all the time, right, right like it is so, it is so about you, <laughs> you know, the feel will make you feel like it's not and you know oh we're objective and you have to be in like that's bullshit too like like it really is about you um if it's something that is just like so egregious you know that's that's like how I always kind of like decide right like so it's for instance you know I won't say anybody's name but I have like I have a, co a white colleague at Tufts you know who is just like so problematic <laughs> Right. Um, but because I don't have to deal with this person on like a regular basis, I just kind of kill it with kindness and keep it moving, you know, versus things that I like I've been in meetings, you know, where there have been like egregious things said. And then I'm just like, OK, hold up. <laughs> Can't let that fly. <clears throat> so it goes on like your capacity. Right. You know, what, what do you want to give your energy to and what do you don't or what do you feel called, right, to give your energy to and, and what and what don't you? Right. OK, I, I just I was going to go to the exhibit, but Nell Painter just asked a question that I just feel like we have to <laughs> talk about. Um, the, and the question is, would you make suggestions for institutions already focused on Black artists and artists of color, institutions founded in the 60s and 70s? That's oh, an interesting okay question because I think a lot of people think it's like that it's only a one type of institution but you're actually talking across the board mm -hmm. 
So yeah, I totally there, would. Yeah, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I totally would. Because I think, you know, that's a great question, Dr. Painter, because I think the historic work is getting lost, you know, or getting, I hate to say lost, but like forgotten almost, you know, maybe outside of the outside of Howard and, and Hampton. And I know Howard has been having some, some, you know, some cutbacks and some issues, Fisk, you know, as well. Um, and I think even in HBCU spaces, that Black Studies framework um, isn't always applied, right? And in the, in the, it's, it, it too is like a traditional kind of canonical art historical tra- um, framework. And so I think those spaces um, could use like a broader kind of cultural history, you know, being brought in where it's not just, you know, the formal elements. Um, and I don't mean in the, mean this at all in like a disrespectful way, but where it's not like just, you know, Dr. Driscoll's um, framework or like Dr. Driscoll's approach. You know, I think we have to expand. I think, you know, Dr. Driscoll would want us to do that too, but like, expanding it to speak, you know, more to the kids on campus, <laughs> you know, and the and the people who engage it, you know, from the community every day. Um, I think we can do that sometimes, you know, in, in Black spaces, Black art spaces, you know, where we can kind of um, perpetuate that elitism, right, and perpetuate that classism, you know, around works that weren't actually constructed, right, or composed or made or developed, for that type of like high art, you know, um, interpretation. And not that there isn't a place, you know, for that too. Um, but I think we need to meld that, you know, the two together a bit more than what we have, you know, particularly in recent years. Right. Okay, so now let's look at the exhibition. I'm excited about this because I think you did such a wonderful job in this, in, in sort of like having people think through, you know, some work. Um, so now, how do you, how would you characterize this um, for you? What were you trying to achieve? Um, and what were some of the, um, I don't know, I mean, I love that the Tim Hawkinson piece is sort of oh. like so central to this. And mm-hmm. you saw that as an important kind of center. Um, do you yes. want to talk a little bit about that and talk about your, the general, the ideas you had for this exhibition? Yeah, because when I, okay, so I, when I started, I started this exhibition or, you know, trying, right? <laughs> to bring this to fruition in real life um, at Newfields in 2018. And it was a really funny story because we were actually walking through the galleries with the garden team, like looking for spaces to put orchids <laughs> for our orchid show. And we went into the contemporary galleries and I knew, cause I was also trying to do this at PAFA in a way as well, where I was like the entire American art narrative, you know, art historical narrative is missing like the primary foundation of why the narrative, the meta narrative exists in and of itself, which is colonization. Right. And so I was like, I was on this mission <laughs> to reinstall an American collection, you know, a permanent collection at a major institution um, through this lens of colonization. And, you know, I was looking around, you know, on different websites and stuff. And um this day, you know, that we're walking through with the garden staff and we go into the contemporary galleries. And it's like, and I had seen this work right before, but it just kind of hit me that day. And I just stayed like, you know, the rest of the two, like the rest of my colleagues went on to like, look at the other galleries and I was just stuck. <laughs> and I was like, this is my piece. Um, So coming off of this piece, which is one, because it's, it's a Mobius strip, right? It's a play on a Mobius strip. Um, two, it's a play on like ship bottle, like model ship, um, ships in a bottle, right? Which is great, you know, in terms of hobby, but that took me back to like all of the model ship collections, right? That exists because we were a maritime, we were such a booming, right? Maritime industry because, right? Of the slave economy and as I researched and thought more through, again, like kind of as a cultural historian, cultural theorist, I thought more about the Mobius, the Mobius strip thing. And I was like, there it is. Like colonization is this loop, right? <laughs> this like never ending loop, you know, right. that we've been on. It closes and, in on itself even. Yes, right? So it, 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 it compresses, it expands. You know, we always um, 
I would always describe it as like the structure um, never changed, but the facade is ever changing. And that, and up until this point, you know, that was how I thought about it. And so I was like, okay, so that's got, that got me to thinking about, well, if there's this piece, you know, in Newfield's collection, I wonder how many other, you know, institutions around the country, like have like a signature piece, maybe not even a contemporary piece, but that can center um, or anchor, right, a reinstall about colonialism. Um, and I was like, I'm pretty sure most of them could. Right. right. <laughs> And I, what I love about the example of this is because it brings in so many different languages, right? And it brings mm -hmm. in everything from contemporary art to historical to, like you said, shipbuilding, yeah, you know, incredible. and the craft of who was building these ships and what were they being used for? And they yes. bring in the economics of it. And and I mean, this is really what art does. I mean, in, in, in this sort of the best way possible. I just think it's such a great example. Um, now we're back at portraiture. Um, because I mean, I think again, portraiture is so foundational for museums even, um, and sort of like what they often display. Do you want to talk a little bit about these portraits and what you think, like, for instance, the Worcester Museum a few years ago added labels right. to those, uh, those portraits that were of enslavers, for instance. Right. Do, you think, do you think that's fruitful and why haven't more museums done that yet? No, I do. I think that is fruitful because at least there is like, that's a start. Um, you know, for these, I was very adamant about saying to people like, listen, you know, any time between, you know, particularly in, in U.S. history, right, 1619, right, even a little bit before that, but let's just go with 1619, right, mm -hmm. but from 1619, you know, to at least 1861, there is no body, okay, not a single person of wealth in this country, white or brown, because you know there were brown folks too, who have not garnered their wealth through some connection to slavery, um, because we were a slave economy that in those that entire time, right? <laughs> that entire era. Um, so I don't care if it was cotton, indigo, you know, ships, um, coffee sales, textiles, whatever, right? <laughs> you know, it was all kind of funneled there. So, or funneled through, right, that, that slave economy. So when you're looking at these portraits of Europeans or Americans of wealth, like nine times out of 10 in military as, as in these two, two figures, but nine times out of 10, you know, I would actually say 9.9 .9 times out of 10, right? <laughs> They are involved in the colonization game. So because there are so many of these portraits that exist across European and American art, I was like, you can actually look up these people and see what, how they were involved. Um, and so I give these two examples of a British, you know, naval officer um, and... Um, One of which is actually named after a colony city. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I was gonna say, Prince of Nassau wasn't actually, he wasn't actually an officer, right? He was this, this kind of like, go along to get along, like explorer. Um, he was actually horrible, right? <laughs> Military officer. But right. Catherine II wanted him, you know, just out of France. So it was just like, yeah, go. You want to go to Tahiti? Yeah, please. Right? <laughs> you want to go to the New World? Yes, please, Jesus. Get out of my face. <laughs> um, I also think it's interesting in the background, there's a sphinx to talk yeah. about antiquities, you know, just to yeah. kind of also add another layer to that. Yeah. And, um, you know, he was instrumental to like the spread of syphilis, you know, through um, wow. Tahiti, um, Sir um, Admiral or Vice Admiral Hughes was a very well celebrated, right, British Admiral. Um, but he was primarily like he was a really success. He was really successful at overthrowing the Spanish, you know, for their colonies in the New World. So as a military um, man, part of the criteria, you know, of being eligible, you know, for a portrait, particularly for someone like from some a painter like Vijay Lebrun or Gilbert Stewart was your success on the colonizing front, right? Or on the, in the new world, like how successful were you, um, you know, in basically, you know, eradicating people, right? <laughs> you know, or, or, 
This also brings up the question, all these artists were clearly, a lot of artists were benefiting from these types of commissions too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it brings up that sort of thorny question as well. Yeah, you know, and so the, the and I'm always so, sometimes I get really frustrated because none of this work, Harag, is like, oh, I'm five years in the American Archives at Smithsonian, right? Or I'm on like a three-year fellowship at the Getty. You know, you know, a lot of this stuff is Googleable. Like, <laughs> you can Google it and easily, find it. Easily Googleable. Yes, yeah. you know? Um, and so that's why, like I said, my frustration sometimes with, with American is because I'm just like, yeah, you don't, you don't know because you just don't want to know at this point. That's right. Because the, because the, the information is there. Um, the, these pieces, um, this is actually like, this is how long I've been working on this stuff. This is actually dissertation work. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually in my dissertation, um, or started, you know, in my dissertation and, um, even back then, you know, which was 2013, 14, 15, you know, and I'm reading about William Wetmore's story and I'm reading about Harriet Beecher Stowe and I'm reading about Longfellow and Ammonia Lewis. And I was like, where is Sojourner Truth? Right? <laughs> like how are all these art, art historians kind of missing the fact that William Wetmore's story himself has said to several people, right? <laughs> That he has built these, and not just Libby and Sybil, but also the Cleopatra as well. Um, you know, and Tyler Green has some really great um, analysis about that, about story in, 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 in Cleopatra and race, right? But I was just like, where is this, you know, in the art history? Um, and it's just not where, it's just not there, you know, and then going trying to get that work out there right and having kind of the the american art sort of publication establishment say well you can't write about imani lewis like that you can't write about william Wilmore story like that you know or you can't write about sojourn the truth like that because nail painter didn't um label her or didn't sort of produce any evidence of her biography about you know truth identifying herself as an artist and i was like okay <laughs> like true but I'm using a very again I'm using a black studies framework we don't necessarily think about you know Frederick Douglass as like a literary artist but he was right. you know so like what's how do we not um consider right Sojourner Truth to be right this visual not just a visual icon but to a certain degree, like a, a muse, you know, for herself, um, whether she said it or not, right? Because she actually does say on the carte de visites, right? Mm -hmm. I sell the substance, I sell the shadow, you know, to, to support the substance. Um, and she's creating these carte de visites, you know, she's constructing them in the same way Lewis constructs hers against what they know. Cause they, cause that's the other thing. They know these people like quite, literally right <laughs> so it's like they know stories um sort of racist undertone right to these works they know Stowe's racist undertones right to her work and particularly somebody like Imonia Lewis who was very close to Lydia, Mar Lydia Maria Child um you know for a number of years before they kind of went their separate ways but Lydia Maria Child is the you know progenitor um of the tragic mulatto trope you know so this idea of like you know mixed race black women just you know not being able to live right because they live between the two worlds and um so the idea that lewis only created um black women figures who looked white you know because she was trying to kind of uh muddy the waters about her own race and I was like mm, she was really close to like she knew William Steele like she knew Francis Harper like as much as she knew the white abolitionists she also knew the black abolitionists again you know had a relationship to some degree right proximity to Harriet Beecher so mm, did anybody think that maybe she may be representing mixed race black women 
maybe she knew an, an actual Eliza, right? Like that kind of stuff. Um, and so these tropes, you know, are very like prominent in the 19th century. Black women, you know, just regular every day, right? Black women are also aware of this, um, but they're aware of themselves. And so, and they're also aware of who the world like believes them to be. So they use photography, just like Frederick Douglass does, right? He's the most photographed you know, man in the 19th yeah. century, right? You know, um, they use photography, you know, to, to say no, right? This is who I believe I am. This is the, the image that I want out there. This is how, you know, I see my family. I see my community. And, you know, Deb Willis and Barbara Crossheimer wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, again, you know, Dr. Painter has a whole book about this. You know, um, you know in terms of Sojourner Truth's participation in it, right? And I'm just like, where, how are we having conversations about neoclassical sculpture and we are not talking about these people? So, Yes, you know, Lewis, the, Lewis is the only Black neoclassical sculptor, Black, you know, female neoclassical sculptor, but she's not the only Black woman that neoclassical sculpture affected. That's right. You know, and I was like, and now you can look at Jennifer Morgan's work, you can look at Charmaine, you know, Nell, and even now Charmaine's book, um, you know, Kirsten Buick's book are pretty old, you know? <laughs> And um and I just uh, this was another moment where I was just like so fed up because <laughs> I was like the scholarship is there, you know like like I have my own you know spin and some of my own theories, but so much of this is like you know me just actually implementing right and applying the black women scholars I studied, you know, <laughs> you know like come on man, um. And so to a certain degree, I'm just, I want people to just go and read. Like, can you just go read for like two seconds? Yep. <laughs> and uh, now, now Painter just mentioned she devoted an entire chapter to Sojourner Truth, the Libyan Civil. And yeah. another chapter to Truth's photograph. So everyone should check that out. Yes. Um, I highly recommend. Um, okay. So now someone, okay, let's go through these because we're getting lots of questions. Thank you for staying with us so we can go through a whole bunch of these. I know people are eager to um, getting, have their questions answered, but we'll try the best we can. Okay. So I'm a Black female curator in the UK working in a university museum, exploring its links with transatlantic slavery in a mm -hmm. white space. I'm currently taking some time away for my well-being from emotional burnout. Yep. Ooh, sound familiar? Yep. Any yep. tips for self-care to keep this work sustainable? Yep, um, I'm getting ready to do the exact same thing this summer. Because <laughs> like I said, I hit a wall in December. I hit a wall in December. And just to be totally, you know, I, I'm, I have a much um, larger audience than usual. But I'm, it, for those who don't know me, I'm very transparent, you know, about this work and the toll it takes. And I had a complete and utter meltdown um, maybe three weeks ago, you know, in, in Chelsea, like just, triggered so badly um at Zorner Gallery and just was like oh this is a problem <laughs> this I should not be standing on the corner of knife and 21 screaming and crying um, um you know was it a certain exhibition or was it something that an experience it was the space yeah right you know to be honest it was like the commodification of just black everything um and, you know, not hating on, you know, Black and temporary artists needing to get their coin. Like, I get it. Um, but I was like, all of this, I, I can't breathe. You know? Right. You know, but it was also like, oh, this is my own trauma. <laughs> no, absolutely. This is my no, own absolutely. trauma. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, I think, I think we all feel that in different ways because, you know, now as things have shifted too, we may not always agree with the decisions our colleagues may take, right? right. And the truth is, we don't always know, and they might know better, and we're all learning, and um, it, it's, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm trying so to be I, very kind about this. <laughs> <laughs> so what I typically do is like, I like, I'm a big spa person, you know, so I try to at least, you know, get my nails done, get my feet done, um, do my massages. Um, I'm a big bath person. So I'm in the tub, like at least, you know, three, you know, four times a week. Um, just to like, let it when I'm in the tub, I'm always like, 
I feel like it's being it's being sucked out. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, um, well, I am well, therapy. Well, so. You know, every I have been in therapy for a very long time, but um, I'm in therapy every Friday. You know, and I am honest with my therapist about you know what it is. And here's another moment of transparency. Like Boston is really hard for me. You know, super isolated. Um, you know, it wasn't like I said, it wasn't the greatest. Right, <laughs> right. Welcome. Um, Tufts is a very interesting institution, you know, so they're in, a, in my sort of inner circle of people is like dwindling because people are, people are leaving, you know, people are resigning. Um, another, you know, again, moment of transparency and honesty, all skin folk and kin folk, right? And it ain't a whole lot of Black folk in Cambridge that are my kind of Black folk, right? <laughs> right? I'm just like, oh yeah, no. Uh, um, you know, so it's, it's extremely, you know, isolating for me. So, um, my mom has been having, you know, some health issues recently. So I'm actually in the process of, um, you know, because my program is virtual. So I'm going to, you know, kind of start commuting, you know, from Detroit because I need that space, you know, like, this is why you see Malcolm and Martin and behind me because I'm at my mom's and my grandmother's recliner. <laughs> Um, because you know, all black people got, you know, Malcolm and Martin up in the <laughs> up in the house. But um, but no, it's like I'm coming home. You know, I'm coming home because I was like, I need my family, right? I need my friends. Like you can't, you just can't do it, you know, in isolation um for a long time. And I've been, this is like year nine, you know, for me. And I was just like, Yep, it's time. I like, yep, I'm going home. <laughs> And knowing, yeah. knowing, knowing the, those networks and maintaining those networks that can nurture you when yes. you have those moments. I mean, that's yes. something that I think people forget that you have to maintain those networks because they're not going to come out of nowhere if you don't maintain them when you need them. Right. So just a reminder. Okay, so now another question. I'm an art professor in a small community college. Do you have any suggestions for resources in addition to your articles that could help bring this topic into the classroom? Well, we did include a bibliography, but I guess somebody's looking for something, I guess, at a small community college. What, what could be something that they may want to look at? A resource? Oh, you could look at um, Latanya Autry's work. Like you could just Google, yes. right? <laughs> like look at Latanya Autry's work. Um, look at the- Museums inclusive. are not neutral. Yeah, museums are not neutral. Um, look at the Inclusium, um, particularly Althea Whitman and Portia Moore's work. You know, I think that stuff is very, you know, should be digestible and accessible to community college students. Um, Mike Morawski's, um, what is the name of his book, Rod? Change Agent, Museums is Change Agents. Yeah, I'll look it up right like now. That. Okay, Karad's going to put that in the chat for, <laughs> for you. Um, there is... Um, and I don't know if Latanya still has it, but like she had a, a bibliography too of like a lot of different resources where it was just like an open link that you could find on her Black Liberation Center, you know, website. Um, I'm trying it to was think Museums of as Agents of Change, a guide to becoming a change maker. Never yeah, heard. that's a good one. Um, I think Nicole Whedon's book, um, Museum Metamorphosis, you know, would be accessible, you know, to um, to community college students um everything else right. I think. oh and alex alice proctor's um what is the name of that book it's something like the colonial heritage it, which is so bad because i taught this book like six weeks ago <laughs> It's all good. Okay, so I think we have some good ones for people. So, um, okay, next question. Um, regarding curatorial and museum de education departments, have you seen projects moments where those departments have worked well together? If so, what was the benefit of this sort of cross-departmental work? Oh, I do. In the, in the second article, The Blowing Holes, um, there's a link to the core team model that um, my colleagues at Newfields developed well before I got there. Um, and we worked across, it was three. So, well, it was all, it was actually all um, museum departments. However, that project was really spearheaded by interpretation, education, um, design and like data, right? Um, and it was again, like a way that we decentered, you know, ourselves as curators um and we all kind of came to the table 
you know, with, um, with collectivity in mind, you know, part of so much of this, I say all the time, y'all, like so much of this work and what makes this work successful is just being a decent person. That's <laughs> like, like <laughs> just wanting to be a decent person. Like sometimes I'm like, it's not always rocket science. Um, you can even get around the silos, you know, in your institution, it takes extra work, you know, you have to do it like, like back to the um, one of the docents, um, who asked the question earlier, like, you know, when I got to new fields, um, because I was so accessible in what I was trying to do, right. <laughs> and the leadership didn't necessarily want me to do. So they like created this, this rule that docents couldn't speak to curators directly. Right. And I was just like, okay, that's, that's wild. So we just start meeting at Starbucks, you know, and just start meeting at each other's ho- at, at each other's homes. You know, it was like, what, like, what, like, we are five, you know, <laughs> you know, we can get this done. Um, so there, those are other ways too. you know, it's like find the people, you know, who actually care about what you care about, want to work on things in the way that you want to work on them. Um, and you work together. I always say building community, both inside, um, and outside the institution is imperative, you know, if you want the work to work. So Latanya Autry is actually here and she's uh, saying, thank you for the conversation and saying, Kelly, so important. You're pushing American art. Um, the restraints that it put, many put on the field adhere to such a carceral mindset. Once those limitations are set, which don't allow more than one or two of the quote unquote others to challenge precedents is akin to the skewed legal system this nation state has in place. Time for art history, art history to get over its jurisprudence outlook. Art historians get over yourselves too. So oh I, think, I think the term really uh, spoke to people. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, Thank it you. does. Yeah, thank you so much, Latanya. That's why I love the work that that you're doing too, Latanya, because it's just, I don't think people in the field always get that, like how directly tied, right? <laughs> right, to the carceral system it is, you know, to our political system. Like we talk about it in healthcare, we talk about it in policing, and I'm like, and it's the exact same thing, you know, in art history and anthropology and our museums. You know, and it's like once you see it, you know, you can't unsee it. Um, and the problem is that like, you know, you had the people who don't who do see it and just don't want to deal with it. Um, and then you had the folks who don't see it at all. Um, but making those like really um direct connections are, is so important. So thank you. Absolutely. And I put Latanya's resource list that was li- listed, um, social justice resources for museums, um, in the chat for those who may be interested. Um, thankfully, somebody else had shared that as well. So I think that's great. Um, okay, a couple of more, more questions here. You have a lot of questions. People are dying to talk to you, Kelly. This is great. Um, okay, yes, it w- it's recorded. This will be recorded so everyone can be assured that it will be up later so people can take a look at that. Okay, so now we have, um, could you speak more on how those of us who are not in decision-making roles in our organizations can push this work forward without burning ourselves um, out or crashing against these systems? Oh, that's interesting. How do we build those alliances? How do we support the work of other people if we're not in those positions to make those decisions? That's a great question. Yeah, it is. Um, you, uh, this is going to sound like so simplistic. <laughs> Sometimes I hate, I hate my answer to that question, but you just have to, you just have to do it. You know, you just, you super, super do. It's like, um, I can remember, you know, one of my first conversations, um, you know, with, with Shadria Laboubier and she was like, people want freedom without the pain. <laughs> right. Um, and it don't work like that. Right. It just don't work like that. Um, you have to do it, you know, and it's like, you don't, don't push yourself to the point of burnout. Of course, like nobody wants to do that, but it, it doesn't come right with, without the pain. It just doesn't. Um, it doesn't come without the discomfort. It doesn't come without like, that's why I call it the blast work, or you may hear me call it the extra work. Like, <laughs> this is why I use the terms that I use because it's difficult. Um, and there's never going to be, right, this sort of neat, nice, succinct, right, <laughs> right, direct way into this work. Like what we are dealing with, like what Tanya, you know, has has shared in her comment, like we are dealing with the capitalist carceral system, 
We just work in the cultural wing of it. It's all the same stuff. You know what I mean? And it will respond to you, right? <laughs> like the matrix. Like I think about it as like the sentinels, right? When they know, when they realize or like, uh, yep. um, oh, what was the agent's name? Like when they realize that they're like in the matrix and they're like fucking around, right? <laughs> right, that's right, exactly. You know, the system will come for you. Um, you know, exactly. so you have you have to be ready for that, and not a lot of people are. No, nope. not okay. a lot of people. Are. Now, this question, I think I know your answer to this, but I'm going to ask you because you do mention it in your article, one of your articles. What do you think of chief diversity officers and their roles in museums? Uh, I feel sorry for them. You know, because a lot of times they're not, most of the time, right? They're not truly supported. Um, you know, I think Renee Franklin is like one of the, you know, as a chief diversity officer, I think she's a chief diversity officer at SLAM. She runs the Bearden program. And it's like, you know, like Renee has been on it, right? <laughs> and has also, you know, been given the resources over a number of years. Um, but most of the time, you know, they are, in my experience, they are um, window dressing, it's, you know, um, so I think about the the MFA Boston right now, you know, that have gone through like three, right? <laughs> right. And I think less than two years, right? Because it's, it's their box checks, you know, um, kind of worse than just hiring the Black curator, right? Or um, recruiting the Black trustee, you know, because um, they're given all the work. They're not given the resources to do the work. You know, a lot of times they're actually like circumscribed, you know, in a way where the work can't happen. Um, museums have a very hard time at the leadership level understanding DEI as a full fledged discipline <laughs> that people have PhDs in, right? Um, you know, so it is, yeah, you know, it's, I, I find it, I find it super sad. You know, and I always tell people like, don't take them jobs. Yeah. Well, don't take those jobs. Yeah. Not in other museums. Yeah. You know, maybe it's different in other institutions, but it's like, no, don't take those jobs. I don't know. I feel like I've heard the same at a lot of institutions. I think most of these positions tend to be under supported um, and, and expect the world with so little resources. So ooh, mm -hmm. definitely not something I envy. Um, okay, so now a couple of more questions. Um, there we are. So now how, this is an interesting question, how once you have a, a, obtained the trust and participation of the community, how would you recommend sustaining those relationships beyond a specific exhibit or project? That's an interesting question because once they built it, how do they keep those people engaged? Well, I mean, for this is why you have to build them into the institutional operation, right? And not just a project. Yeah. <laughs> um, they have to become a part, like basically like an extension, I hate to say staff, but like an extension of, you know, the thought staff, you know, they have, they have to be the person, you know, and it's always interesting when I, when I hear those questions, right, because we never ask those questions about boards, and boards are at the institution, board members are at, at, are, at are actually at the institutions, participating in what the institution is doing, Half of them don't even come to the meetings on a regular basis, right? Right, You know, so it's, it's, it's also about value, right? So it's not so much about building those relationships and those connections to an exhibition or a program. It's about building those relationships into the functionality of the organization itself. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's how you sustain it because you ask people who live in the community, what do they want out of the institution? You know, and sometimes people will tell you, I remember in, in, in India and people were just like, well, we don't really necessarily, well, not everybody, but there were, you know, a certain group who was just like, we don't really care, you know, but if we could use the galleries for our, you know, our Bible study meetings. Right. And I was like, cool. <laughs> you know, <and> so, <laughs> what I would do, you know, as in, as, as, or with, you know, sort of my authority as associate curator of American art, I would stay on Wednesdays, you know, so this group could come do their Bible study. 
I didn't ask security, right? <laughs> you know, I didn't bother our COO, which I probably should have told our COO. But, um, but I would just, you know, find something else that I needed to do. Sometimes I would participate in the conversation. Sometimes I wouldn't, um, you know, but I would just, you know, stay in the galleries and, and, and just say, oh, I'm giving a tour. But I was really, I was really there to allow them to do what they wanted to do in the space outside of like the event space. You see what I'm saying? Like particularly poor working class black communities, you know, maybe you, maybe you can rent the event space, maybe you can't, but how often are you allowed to actually use the gallery, you know, for something that you want to do? So as a curator, I was like, you can use whatever space I can get you access to, right? <laughs> right? So it's like those kinds of things um, are the, are, like, are the things, are the things that we have to do, you know, utilize your position to do. Um, to change the way things operate. And again, leadership wasn't happy about it, but I didn't care right. because the ladies were happy about it. You know, it's like, who is your, who do you, um, who is your allegiance? I would always say like, I don't work, you know, for this institution. I work for the communities around it. Right. And who's your audience and which audiences are you listening to? Right. Okay. So now this person is asking, this is interesting. I'm an art conservator and conservation is built on policing visitors and even other museum staff. I really relate to this idea of the carceral state, particularly applied to conservation. Interesting perspective, oh. but there are de definitely many of us pushing against this in conservation and of course in other departments, but we often feel like a minority in institutions. What are better ways we can support each other across departments? Well, it's the second question we've had about this. I think people are really looking for this way that they can connect. So that's an interesting, because conservation is not really an aspect of the museum field that we think of when we think of the diversity questions. Um, no, and, you know, and those questions are happening. You know, I think about Jane Henderson's, you know, essay that's been, you know, going around for a, a few years, since 2020 right now. Um, you know, there's also, there is a organization of Black conservators too, you know, who have been doing a lot of work in this area. Um, and part of it, you know, again, just that whole, like, how do you support? You have to go. So if, so, okay, prime example. <laughs> when I started at Newfields, I mean, sorry, when I started the Birmingham Museum of Art, Birmingham was one of those institutions that had a, it was a fraught relationship, you know, between education in the curators. So I, as a fellow, because this is like my first fellowship. So I just watched, you know, I would go to the, I would go to the meetings and I would watch the dynamics. Okay. So-and-so doesn't get along with so-and-so. So-and-so thinks they know everything, right? <laughs> right. So-and-so just totally dismisses this, this, this. Education likes the labels to be written in this particular way. Curators, <laughs> these particular curators weren't trained to write like that. Like you have to, like, I, I swear to God, if I had known how much psychology <laughs> went into like doing the work that I do, like I do it, I would've took way more psych class. So, <laughs> you and me both. Right, like way more. Okay, <laughs> so when I figured out their dynamic, right, as, as, as well as building my own relationships individually with the curators, with the educators, and then with both institutions, with both departments I was like okay they can't stand each other right? <laughs> in certain certain dynamics but everybody likes me so on my small show I'm going to shift the way that we work and write labels based on how everybody feels about working with me Right. So from the energy that I was able to cultivate in my own individual relationships that then softened, right? Right. A lot of the silos and a lot of the barriers and you know, mended some fences between some of them. Um, and it's a completely different culture now. Mm -hmm. hey, totally different culture. Um, totally different people too. So, you know, so much of it in terms of that working together is like. You have to find, like, you have to meet people where they are. You know, you have to want to do that. Like, nobody's necessarily going to show you, right? Nobody in your institution, right? Nobody on leadership is going to say, okay, this is what we're going to do today. Because <laughs> they don't want us working together in, in, in that regard anyway. Um, 
so much of it for me is a, like that's just how I work right it's like collaboratively it's just my thing um you know and I make the time you know I really do I make the time to do it and so that's so what I do <laughs> we're, we're hitting the the 90 minute mark so I'm going to slip in one last question just because I think this is actually I've never heard this question asked and I'm just it, but it seems so obvious and kind of interesting so I want to mention it how do you okay. overcome museum goers assumptions about chronology I see people consistently assuming that African art is older or more ancient than European art no matter how clearly things are labeled or arranged what an interesting question and it's so true Say the first part again, how do you get over? So it's like how to, assumptions about chronology because people assume, for instance, African art, even though that's say a lot of the African art in museums might have been made during the lifetime of Picasso, right? Right. But, but for some reason, people assume it's ancient, right? Mm -hmm. and older. Mm -hmm. And I guess somebody who must be working in a museum is trying to understand how do we resolve this kind of um, disconnect? So I point out, usually in those cases, because I don't work with African art often, but whenever I'm asked about that, I point out the fact that that was a very specific design coming over from ethnographic museums um, to very purposely freeze African and indigenous objects and people right into a past, you know, so that the modern sort of white subject could live right basically um could exist you know that's a very deliberate um sure. dynamic right and design you know and so you have so pulling out you know showing again like those objects in their actual cultural um spaces and, and context as as best you as best as one can um you know demonstrating that this was made in the 1940s right right <laughs> you know and not necessarily like 500 bc right. um and that it is you know often interpreted that way because that is how as a museum public we've been socialized to see that's right because that thought you know of native americans indigenous um nations and peoples and communities african nations and peoples and communities being frozen in time you know in past time like that is the very psychic like or you know mind state that like keeps people from identifying with black people being shot down in the street by cops right with what's happening on the border to latinx communities you know what's happening with these oil pipelines you know it keeps us from actually identifying with how those same things those same oppressive systems in nature um are affecting right people who descend you know from those places and from those people yeah you know i think that's such a great great example i mean we talk about the vanishing indian tropes yes. years ago those were also used to justify the looting of their artifacts frankly mm -hmm. um, and and a few years ago some something that was brought up that had, I've thought about ever since was during the border crisis during the uh, years of the Trump administration. Um, you know, one curator pointed out to me that, you know, we talk about Maya artifacts, but people don't realize those most of those children and the people at the border were actually Maya. Yes. We often, and that disconnect why in our imagination Maya is only in the past tense and not in a present tense yes. is already by design. Well, I knew Kelly, this conversation would be fantastic. And I just want to thank you. And for the hundreds of people who showed up and I'm sorry, we still have 37 questions we haven't been able to get to. And I'm very sorry for all those. We will be putting this up online and, um, and I'm sure this is not the last we've heard from you, Kelly. And thank you so much for being generous with all your, uh, with all the facts and the framing to help people sort of understand the breadth of this issue. Yeah, thank you, Harai. I thank you so much, you know, just for the opportunity, you know, thank everybody for being here um, tonight. This was really, really, really great. I'm always so excited. Um, I shouldn't be shocked anymore, but I, but I am, you know, when it's so well received, you know, because it's been, I have, I have faced so much opposition, you know, um, for it for so long. Um, so yeah, from the bottom of my heart, I just thank you so much.
No, pleasure. And thank you for the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation for sponsoring this fellowship and look forward to everyone next week. We'll be continuing the series. We're at uh, number three out of five um, and soon enough, we'll be wrapping up soon. And thank you everyone for participating. Okay, take it easy. Bye.